So, dear participants, hello and welcome to the qualifying stage task uh, presentation of the International Data Analysis Olympiad uh, IDAO 2022. This is the fifth IDAO Olympiad, uh, and we are happy to have Yandex on our site for the fifth time. We are also deeply grateful to the platinum partner of this year's Olympiad, uh, Atkritya Bank. And uh, the qualifying stage task was created by the International Laboratory of, uh, of Methods for Big Data Analysis, Lambda for short. It has become a good tradition for, uh, it is the fourth time that Lambda creates the task for IDAO. And uh, we are now joined by the colleagues from Lambda who will introduce the task and the field of study in general. So please welcome uh, the head of Lambda Lab, Andrei Ustujanin. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. So actually I'm going to say uh, a few most common sense words. Um, and indeed it is the fourth time that we organize uh, a challenge for, for this Olympia. So, Previously, it, it has spanned from particle physics uh, to satellite prediction and position estimation, uh, dark matter search in the previous year. And, and now we are touching the topic of new materials. And uh, essentially, it is a, a really hot area because uh, new materials will give a lot of a lot of uh, improvements and a lot of advantages in, in many areas. Just uh, mentioned on the slides are the few. And I, I hope uh, uh, Konstantin Novoselov, who uh, uh, has, has also actively participated in preparation of this challenge, and he, he's going to talk about the materials uh, right after me. And, and he can do it much better. I, I just wanted to highlight a few things. So uh, the, the, the paradigm shift that's happening in modern science nowadays uh, become more and more visible, all right? So uh, nowadays, uh, research without the help of um, advanced statistical learning and data mining or uh, pattern and anomaly detection methods uh, becomes uh, somewhat obsolete and, and uh, people may start asking questions why uh, researchers ha hadn't used it. While previously it was like uh, novel methods was always scrutinized and always uh, been doubted about it, about, uh, doubted and, and it, it was <laughs> uh, the, the, the role of researchers to prove why they started to apply some advanced algorithms when nobody nobody tried to do this. But um, maybe one of the breakthrough uh, of the recent time that has happened uh, just a year before, or maybe a couple of years already, but the paper has been published just in 2021 about AlphaFold by DeepMind that uh, was capable of predicting a complicated structure of the molecule uh, of a really long protein, uh, just using the uh, some some basic configuration of such molecules. Such task usually required quite a bit of computations and uh, accuracy of uh, analogous methods that relied on some computational tools and algorithms um, was not very high. And uh, with the with the invention uh, of DeepMind. Uh, it, it, it became a new state of the art with the help of advanced deep learning methods. In um, this challenge, we uh, focused on a little bit or maybe completely different topic. And together with colleagues from uh, other universities like in Innopolis University, SIT and NUS, uh, we uh, created this challenge just uh, to start the common uh, research and common development in this field. So uh, I, I would like to mention just a few 
uh, tips and tricks that might come handy uh, while you will be working on this challenge. So the first one is that uh, a really helpful tool that, that will allow to deal with such structures are graphical neural networks, graphical neural models. And uh, there are a few sources of inspiration that you can use. Uh, one of those is Open Catalyst Challenge um, by Facebook and uh, I think Carnegie Mellon or Stanford University. And um, also when you be dealing with the data, uh, try to, try to, well, of course, material science uh, would require some basic understanding how molecules are interacting. So material science one-on-one -on -one would not hurt and look for symmetries and invariants that uh, present in the data that, that uh, might be uh, fed into the architecture of the network. And uh, the best contributions that uh, will happen dur during the challenge, I think, uh, will be turned into a scientific publication. Uh, and if you want, we can, we can, we can uh, help with this. And uh, of course, if you're interested in exploring this field further and working on similar research projects, uh, feel free to contact. Uh, I, I think we can find something uh, to work on. And this is basically all I wanted to mention just to uh, start today's session. And uh, without uh, further ado, I hope there are no questions <laughs> to what I mentioned. Uh, uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, pass the word to Konstantin Vasilov, Nobel Prize winners for uh, discovery of graphene. Uh, and he, he has co-discovered it with uh, Andre Gein. Uh, also, he is a director of the research center at Singapore on functional intellectual materials. So, Konstantin, uh, um, please. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, for, the, for the introduction. Really a pleasure to be here. So let, let me try to share, uh, uh, share my, my screen. Um, please, uh, please confirm that you can, you can see it. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, I can. Great. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you some background information on which you might or might might not use for this for this challenge but also just give you the uh, a bit of a story uh, of the two-dimensional materials and and where this uh, this this research is uh, is going going right now and let me start with uh, with, with with graphene which is the first and probably the 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 the, the simplest possible uh, two-dimensional material. It's uh, it just it's a flat. You can think about it as a flat molecule, which consists only of of uh, of carbon atoms arranged in a in a honeycomb lattice. And uh, despite its its simplicity, so carbon is one of the lightest elements available to us. Uh, so honeycomb lattice also looks very, very simple. It has uh, really a number of uh, uh, very interesting properties and it's be, it has been researched over the last what, 15 years and it's still been, uh, being researched very, very actively. And one of the, uh, one of the reasons for that is exactly what uh, Andre mentioned, that you need to look into, into symmetries and the honeycomb lattice Though it, it looks very very simple, it's actually not one of the simplest Bravi lattices. In order, in order to create this lattice, you need to replicate two two atoms. So I I, I, I colored them red red and green here, even though we all know that carbon atoms are blue. But uh, but you can also see that um, so red would have all, always a. a, a uh, a bond from the from below green from the top. So to create the honeycomb lattice, you really need to uh, start moving those uh, a pair of these of these two atoms in in space, and then you you should be able to 
to to recreate the honeycomb layers. You, you won't be able to do it if you move only only one uh, only one atom. So now if, if, if we have uh, in physics we say that we have two atoms per per unit cell and and because of that we need to allow quantum mechanically for electrons to be present from, uh, simultaneously on both uh, green and 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 red atoms and that's uh, uh, that has a consequence that we have two electronic bands and they uh, they cross each other at some specific points uh, in terms of in terms of momentum and this is, uh, and these specific points give rise to the so, to the linear uh, linear um, uh, dispersion relation usually of course kinetic energy is quadratic in uh, in uh, with with velocity with, uh, with with momentum. Here we have a bit unusual relations for 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 energy. So it is linear with momentum, just like like light or uh, photons. And be, and because of that, we have a number of really unique unique electronic and optical properties in uh, in this material i'm not going to go too too deep into uh into uh into physics we won't write any any equations just 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 one example so um of course you from experience every day well, hopefully not every day experience you know that if you run a car into into a concrete wall you would you would crash it so in quantum mechanics, there is a phenomenon called tunneling, which in principle allows you to penetrate through an energy barrier with a certain probability. So tunneling, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to observe for microscopic objects, but in the, in the microscopic world, it's, uh, it's, it's a well, uh, well studied phenomena it's uh, it's actually a big problem for uh, semiconductor industry tunneling uh, as the um, our transistors get smaller and smaller and smaller the contribution of tunneling of electrons through barriers uh, gets gets larger so it is an issue but generally it is still quite um, quite a, a small effect which is completely negligible on the in the macroscopic world so in the relativistic physics which we see or quasi relativistic physics which we see in 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 graphene the probability to go through uh, through a, a, a potential barrier is exactly 100% so called Klein tunneling so it's the is the effect which is um, which has been long thought after uh, in the relativistic physics, but it can be quite easily observed in uh, in in graphene, and then many many other similarly uh, maybe counterintuitive uh, phenomena which you can see in uh, in this this material, which all can be traced back to the uh, to this honeycomb honeycomb symmetry. So because of that, there are number of uh, of of interesting applications for graphene so electrons in graphene because they can penetrate through any barrier they, they cannot be stopped so then it, it means that the figure of merit for the performance of the of the transistors which is called mobility how fast electrons can travel and then how easy is it to 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 accelerate them so this uh, figure of merit in silicon it's usually 1000 in 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 graphene it, it it can be it can be one million and and then similar similar linear dispersion relation also is responsible for for the optical transparency of 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 graphene so graphene is of course only one atom thick and yet you can actually see it with your naked eye it, it absorbs not a not a negligible but small but not negligible uh, amount of light it absorbs exactly 2.3 percent of light which is given and this number 2.3 percent is given by uh, a combination of the fundamental constants it's pi times alpha alpha is the is the 
fine uh, fine fine structure constant. So there are quite a quite a number of those unique interesting uh, interesting phenomena associated with the simple honeycomb symmetry and the linear dispersion relation. And because of all those all those interesting sometimes unique properties and definitely unique combination, it's the uh, most conductive material, uh, very transparent, uh, flexible, strong, impermeable, and, and so on. It has uh, a number of potential applications, but well, not only potential. It has been uh, it has been producing quite uh, quite some applications already. So, well, um, for for our students, for our our graduates, probably do, the most important application is that it creates workplaces. So lots of our graduates opened uh, a number of uh, a number of companies, uh, many of them uh, successful. Uh, well, it was a joke until one one day I received the uh, regular copy of Glamour, and then on one of the on one of the pages he reads that the five jobs our kids will be doing among, among the top five there is graphene engine. So then it also provides entertainment. I'm sure that many of you have seen this uh, this sitcom, the, the Big Bang Theory, and then in one of the episodes, Lon uh, Sheldon, the, the uh, street theorist from Caltech, who is trying to figure out why electrons in graphene behave as massless relativistic particles. You already all know that it's because of the honeycomb symmetry, but uh, so he spends uh, a full episode trying to figure it out because some of the formula on that whiteboard actually wrong. They're from they're for biography, not not for for monolayer. And uh, well, it also gives shelter, so there are streets named after after graphene. But in reality, there are many there are many applications already being using graphene. So I'll just go quickly through them as as. Every single one, every single advanced material before it starts its its way uh, through uh, applications in composite materials like uh, tennis rackets, I don't know, skis, golf clubs, whatever. And we also participated, created this. We collaborated with Richard Miller and McLaren to create this world lightest, unfortunately, and also world most expensive watch, one million Swiss Swiss franc for for uh, thirty two grams. Um, if you haven't got one million, you can spend quarter of a of million pounds for for this for this car, and it's uh, it's actually one of the first real applications where um, the so graphene is actually being used not for the sake of uh, of of the uh, of mass reduction or strengths it's actually to speed up the production because it, it gives you uh it, it because of its thermal conductivity but so it's so this company it's only maybe less than a thousand cars per year but uh there are also uh but these days there are uh, uh but um these days graphene can be found in pretty much Every single, uh, every single uh, Ford car, and again, its application is quite is quite unusual. So it's because it's uh, noise cancellation properties. From the hindsight, you would probably imagine that uh, 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 two-dimensional material should create lots of interfaces, but it's uh, it's it's not it's not exactly. Well, it, it took uh, Ford engineers quite quite some work to 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 bring it to life, and then from noise cancelling to noise creation. So, one of my favorite companies is the uh, the company which produces graphene headphones. So, for the headphone, what is important is that your membrane is light and stiff at the same time, and it's um, and that's that's what that's all that's all that's all graphene. And then if we go to more electronic-like application, uh, these days graphene is the uh, is the must material to, to have for thermal management in any electronic devices. It has higher thermal conductivity than 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 copper, and that's um, that's very important for 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 any for any electronic applications these days. 
um, if you want to calibrate your your voltmeters, uh, your your ohmmeters, so then these days graphene is the material of choice for the uh, resistance standard, which is done through the measurements of the quantum Hall effect in in this material, and then uh, for the photo detectors for uh, for autonomous vehicles being being produced these days by by former Nokia uh, and um, I think most one of the most promising applications is the use of graphene for telecommunication for um, for uh, optical circuits uh, where it is used in combination with with silicon photonics now if we are talking about the future I think uh, the use of of graphene as membranes because it's the two-dimensional membrane is the ultimate membrane is one of the most promising for a number of different areas and technologies so it is completely impermeable for many for, for most atoms and and uh, and molecules yet we can modify it to make permeable for some uh, some uh, species and then we can basically use it for biological application or for water desalination for 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 iron extraction and so on and for some time of course there was a there was an issue if we can produce enough uh, enough enough graphene because originally uh, a long time ago we started with the with the use of the scotch tape we simply uh, scotch tape method you simply exfoliate mechanically graphite which you find in your uh, in your left pencils and you just uh, you just split it until you get exactly monolayer luckily these days we have a number of other uh, other methods how to um, how to produce graphene depending on the price you want to pay on the quality you want to achieve you can get uh, you can do it by chemical vapor deposition when you write when you run uh, carbon containing gas like methane for example on top of the hot surface of of a metal which has some catalytic properties so then this uh, those uh, those carbon containing molecules would uh, would those hydrocarbons would crack on the surface hydrogen flies away carbon rearranges itself on the surface and you get a monolayer of uh, of graphene, and the beauty is that you you can use pretty much anything to uh, any any carbon con containing species to produce graphene. So here is our example, our attempt to produce iron doped um, doped uh, doped graphene. So what 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 you do? You basically prick your finger, put some blood on. Or, on copper, stick it into into your into in, into furnace, and you get your iron dot from uh, iron dot graphene from your from your erythrocytes. So, but then there are other methods. You can exfoliate graphite in in liquid and get monolayers of graphene suspended in 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 liquid. So that's used for printable electronics, for composites, for batteries, for bio applications. Plus a few other, a few other ways um, uh, as well, some epitaxial techniques. Now um, that's more or less an introduction, and uh, the the development of of this of this story is coming uh, through the fact that okay, we can uh, exfoliate lead pencils, and then we can we get we get graphene. What happens if we exfoliate other pencils? Can we get other materials as well? And the answer is yes. And some time ago, we realized that um, so graphene is actually not alone. You can exfoliate uh, other layered materials, and you get monolayers of 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 other materials as well. Or there are actually other two D crystals which can be grown directly without uh, not through the the three-dimensional precursor basically these days we're talking about not only graphene but we're talking about a family of two-dimensional materials they all uh, have one thing in common they're only one uh, atom or one unit cell thick 
but, uh, but th their properties can be very, very different from the most insulating like boron ni nitride to semiconducting like molybdenum sulfide to semi-metals, metals, there are ferromagnets, there are superconductors. So it's uh, so the, the range of properties is really huge. And again, what is interesting is to study physics in those 2D materials because physics in two dimensions is usually very different than physics in, in, uh, in three dimensions. And so you really, the properties of those materials sometimes change really radically once you get to the one uh, one uh, atomic one one uh, atomic layer limit so but then a part of the study of of, of all those 2d crystals uh, the uh, the uh, the fact that we've got in our hands so many 2d materials open very very new very unusual uh, opportunities because uh, imagine uh, so that each two-dimensional material is like a, a sheet of paper where you, you can write a story, a short story, that's the properties of those materials. But what if you can put those materials together and make a book out of those, out of those stories? You actually, you can write uh, much more interesting novel uh, if you combine many pages together and that's exactly what we do in the lab because these days we can come to our lab to we've got those two-dimensional crystals available to us under a microscope and then what we can do we can start putting them together but into a three-dimensional stack back into to create back a, a three-dimensional material but in a sequence in a way Mother Nature never intended it, it to be. So we can actually program the properties of those of those artificial materials the way we want it to be, and we can uh, program the functionality. So the material, uh, the our three dimensional material, become the device at the same time. And indeed, a number of uh, new devices have been produced this way, like. Uh, tunneling transistor, for example, some solar cells, photo detectors, photo diodes. The, the quality of this artificial three-dimensional stack, three-dimensional material can be, can be very high. So here is an example of, uh, a, of a cross section of such material as you can see in the, uh, in the uh, scanning uh, transmission electron microscope. So here we started with um, boron nitride and then added two layers of graphene and then two layers of boron nitride and then two more layers of graphene, two layers of, uh, of boron nitride and then two more layers of graphene again. So it has been done for a reason. So we're trying to make a tunneling heterostructure um, to tunnel from one uh, by layer graphene to another through uh, mid gap steps uh, states in the uh, in, in another one, and and uh, basically uh, the quality, especially if you look at the at the dark field image, can be extremely high. You won't be able to see where your bulk layer uh, stops and where your where your where your graphene starts. So and the 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 complexity of this of these materials can be uh, can be uh, extremely high. So here is the example of our uh, uh, composite materials which act as a light emitting diet. So we really so we programmed it in such a way we introduced uh, those semiconducting layers which act as a, as quantum wells. And then if you inject electron and hole. Uh, into it, so they can recombine, and then they 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 create they emit emit light, and um, so it's it's really very complex heterostructures, but surprisingly they actually work and work uh, exactly as we uh, as we intended them uh, them to work. So 
the so these days because the the range of the properties of those of those materials the, the range of those materials is quite is quite large so we can really even if we're talking about those light light emitting diets so we can really cover a huge range of the of the uh, of the light emission so suitable for many different applications from uh, from telecommunication like modern day, day, day telluride to to normal leds and but that's that's not it so we can actually modify those those individual crystals and we can for example create quantum dots quantum dots are the are the objects which can emit one um, one photon at a time and that's uh, that's extremely important for uh, for such applications as uh, for example quantum uh, quantum telecommunication so these days we can um, create those those quantum dots in the two dimensional materials and in reality it's a it's a specific, very specific defect in those two two D materials, and uh, part of the of the problems which you are going to solve is exactly on the defects in in the semiconducting uh, materials, which are exactly the structures which we need to create those um, those uh, light emitting uh, uh, single photon emitters. Uh, so we we can create them. On demand, we can put it into the in, in, into the light 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 emitting diet, and it does uh, it works it works um, it works incredibly well. Uh, I also wanted to give you another example of this um, defect engineering, just to, to show that uh, that uh, people look very very seriously at the. Uh, defect uh, uh, the defect engineering and that's the attempt to to create uh, to create um, uh, graphene quantum dots embedded into into uh, insulating boron nitride matrix so the the very way how it was done is quite is quite innovative so people uh, so we created um, we created tiny uh, platinum islands and then we transferred uh, boron nitride, which is an insulating two-dimensional material, on top of that. And then by running a, 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 a chemical reaction, which requires uh, a platinum assistance as a as a catalyst, we can convert this insulating boron nitride into conductive graphene only where platinum is present. So in this way, we create tiny tiny uh, graphene islands which act as quantum dots inside of the um, inside of the boron nitride matrix and that's um, and then we can plug it into uh, build it in, build it this those quantum dots into uh, again a, a three dimensional one devils heterostructure and use it as the as the single uh, single electron tunneling tunneling transistor with the Characteristic diamonds uh, with the characteristic diamond uh, stability diagram. So um, I'm just I'm a bit worried that uh, that I'm giving uh, putting too much information into into uh, into one talk. So, but um, just one thing which you need to to remember that physics in two dimensions is different, often different than physics in three dimensions, and then. Uh, we can modify the two-dimensional crystals, introduce defects, and and that those defects can be can be functional as well. Uh, something which you probably won't need for for this um, for this challenge, but I will mention it anyway. Is one um, one additional uh, additional uh, opportunity capability. Which offer, which uh, uh, which is offered to us by this technology of creating three-dimensional stack by hands by putting individual layers on top of each other, that we can control not only the uh, type of the materials which we can which we are putting together, not only all the thickness of the individual crystals, but also how do we rotate them from one layer to another, 
and if you rotate them in the real space, we also rotate them in the reciprocal space, and that really gives us uh, a lot of control over the electronic structure uh, of those of those materials. Uh, let me let me skip this, but uh, we can control it. We can do it in many different ways. So we can so we do it during the preparation of the of the of this of those stacks, or we can uh, use micro manipulators to rotate uh, individual crystals in the in the existing stack or we can uh, we can actually grow them uh, by by mass production grow those those uh, twisted twisted uh, twisted crystals so you can see there are so this large hexagon is one crystal the the small hexagon is another crystal and they are clearly rotated with respect to each other and it can be seen in the in um, in the uh, transmission electron microscope uh, by uh, through this through the observation of this Moira pattern as when when you put two periodicities on top of each other they will create this Moira pattern that's exactly the effect which we see in those in those twisted crystals and that's the that's the effect which was which really gave uh, boosted um, uh, and gave another way of, of research to the field of the two-dimensional crystal because by rotating simple simple rotation uh, of the of of the neighboring crystals in this stack which we which we create can change the uh, electronic properties radically for example you take two two graphene crystals graphene so carbon uh, carbon based material so, uh, supposed to be very simple nothing nothing exciting but then really we, you can by twisting it you can turn it into a superconductor or or into 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 insulate so really uh, or into, into even into uh, a ferromagnet so that's really that's really quite quite an exciting direction of research and many research group these days do uh, uh, do work on this so i think i will i will probably i will probably stop here and basically summarize that um, these days there are many two them two two dimensional materials they all have very different properties the properties of the two dimensional materials often very different from the properties of their three dimensional counterparts and uh, so that gives you really access to uh, to a lot of new science but then we can also manipulate the properties of those two-dimensional materials by introducing defects or by stacking them into into uh, three-dimensional stacks as well and um, so that really offers a lot of a lot of opportunities for modern technologies where you can create materials with the predetermined properties so we're not uh, relying on the existing materials anymore we can create new material for new application every time so i think i will i will stop here and i will uh, i'll be happy to to answer uh, any questions uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation uh, are there any questions? Uh, you can also write your questions in the chat so we can read it out loud. <clears throat> oh, I see we have some. Um, is graphene used in VAX as well. well I think uh, well, I think wax it means for uh, for the uh, for the lubrication properties. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it, that's uh, people use graphene for for uh, of course people have been using graphite for many many uh, many decades exactly for lubrication and the and the the uh, the reason for that is the so-called uh, superlibricity property when you twist uh, 
exactly related to what I've been I've been uh, telling you about when you twist uh, two layers of of graphene with respect to, to each other, they they're no longer registered in terms of atoms on top of another atom. So the atoms are are, are randomly situated with respect to the atoms in the other layer and then the friction pretty much disappears so you get you get uh, you, you get the effect of the so-called super lubricity the uh, so uh, so graphene uh, for uh, is rarely used solely for for that because graphite works 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 quite well what is it used used more often is uh, the combination of uh, of the lubricant and uh, and uh, thermal management. So for for those applications, people try to use to, to use to use graphene as well. Thank you. I think there is another question. What is required by us to do from point of view of data? Uh, well, okay. I think it's probably. Uh, a question to Aziz, right? So that's uh, um, so we can. I think the, the the particular task is better to be described by by AI experts. So Aziz, is it is it is it correct? Yeah, yeah. I will answer these questions. So I will probably pass this the, this question to 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 Aziz. He will exactly tell you. What uh, was the structure of the data and and how to how to use it and what is what you can and what you cannot do with it? Uh, but there is another part to this question. Can you read it? Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, can you please give us some examples where the two D materials are already classified or found? How so? Already classified or or found? Uh, okay, so the so uh, a part of so currently I would say in real applications uh, graphene is the is the most used and then I gave you a few examples already the largest so so I mean anyone with Huawei mobile phone or anyone uh, with the fourth card so the, you come across this uh, every day but um, uh, the largest consumer is probably uh, is probably um, the battery. So modern battery technology is very, very complex. So they use graphite, carbon nanotubes, graphene, uh, nanosilicon, a bit of carbon black. So, uh, so battery technology consumes probably about uh, hundreds of tons of graphene every uh, every year. So um, that's. Um, so I think so. There are, but uh, there are many other examples which I which I gave you already. In terms of the the other two D materials beyond beyond graphene, I don't think there are there are um, uh, you can find them yet in any in any particular applications. Um, the probably if if we need to if I need to speculate the. Uh, I think the most promising is the use of the 2D semiconductors for uh, for uh, for for telecommunication. So I, I showed you examples of the Ericsson um, uh, of electronic set, setups, but uh, probably 2D materials would work even better for that. And I think so. That's the that's one of the of the most promising application. Uh, thank you. I think there is another question. Um, graphene has the ability to exhibit. Um, however, how does it diffuse? Can it be used over long distance delivery of bioactive substances in a way not as a carrier? Uh... Uh, 
okay so right um uh, uh right so uh so indeed one of the um, one of the um one of the applications uh which um, which people do consider is the drug delivery and so for for that uh there are many different modes for that it hasn't been it hasn't been used yet but uh but indeed many groups are working in, including our groups on this so the the basic the basic story is that um many many drugs are so sensitive to changes of the chemical environment that they they, they have to be admitted directly into the into the bloodstream like what is happening with or or at least into into muscles that that's what was uh what 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 happens with your vaccine you cannot it's at, at this moment of time it's very difficult to simply swallow a pill with the vaccine because it will be destroyed by and filtered out uh by uh, in, uh, destroyed in your in your stomach and filtered out by your kidney before it actually start start working so for that the the strategy of the drug drug delivery and um and uh, delivery vehicles is being developed for example you can attach something to graphene which stops it uh, to interact with the with the environment and then only once it gets to the target then it gets it then it it releases uh, it, the 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 drug and so you can do it by for example um wrapping so, so because graphene is uh, is is flat molecule it's a membrane you can wrap it quite easily and then unwrap it at, at, at specific conditions and what we're trying to do is to program graphene by um uh, attaching certain certain species which take which make it either hydrophilic or hydrophobic to to be wrapped uh, all the time while it, it goes through your stomach, for example, and then unwrap only at a, at, at a specific location uh, in your body. So uh, indeed, so graphene can be wrapped and can be even a large sheet of graphene can be can be wrapped into into a small a small volume pass through some pores. So people are speculating if it can go through the um, through the uh, blood uh, blood brain barrier and then and then deliver those those uh, those uh, those drugs to the target so that's the theory lots of groups are working on it but nothing is on the market yet um, thank you are there any more questions I, I think that's that. Um, to all those uh, interested, yes, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel later. Um, so if we are quite finished, yes, uh, thank you, Professor, for this very interesting presentation. And uh, now I'd like to pass the word to Aziz Almaini, a Lambda researcher, who will talk about the machine learning aspect of this uh, IDAO 2022 task. Hello. Uh, you hear me well, right? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so to, today my uh, agenda for the uh, is to introduce you to the baseline, then walk you through the data and how to actually submit your your results to the Yandex contest uh, platform. So uh, you got the link to the uh, to the GitHub where you have the task, and it's organized in the following way. So uh, let's walk uh, with the problem. So uh, in the data folder, you you will have uh, two. Uh, archives uh, with the public and the private, and each one of them contain a JSON of imagine structures. Uh, those structures contain the atom type and the XYZ coordinate of each atom and 
uh, plenty of other uh, other important uh, physical attributes that describe the crystal. So here, if you if you take any sample from the data and you plot it with Pymagin plotting capability, uh, you will you will observe the following. So uh, you you can see uh, that each color is basically a different atom. So here we have uh, molybdenum and the yellow is sulfur, and we can observe that uh, there is a, well, we call it a defect where this atom with this atom is the sulfur has been substituted with another atom of different elements such as selenium. So uh, this is a defect, and this uh, actually this defect actually changed the characteristics uh, of the crystal, and th this is very important, and you should take it into account. And here we observe another irregularity in the crystal, and we will have a missing uh, molybdenum atom. So uh, we have another defect here. Uh, uh, it's called the uh, vacancy defects where we have a missing atom. So basically we have uh, two types of defects here, uh, substitution where this atom has been substituted by another atom and the vacancy we have a missing atom. So, uh, and again, I repeat those defects change the physical attributes of the crystal and they have a direct correlation to what you're trying to solve. Uh, so uh, this problem from the from the machine learning point of view, it's a regression problem. Uh, so you will have this uh, crystal. Uh, it has a bunch of uh, uh, dependent variables and your independent, uh, sorry, your a uh, bunch of independent variables and your dependent variable is basically the band gap energy. And this band gap energy is just a scalar uh, that to present uh, uh, some physical attributes mainly. Uh, things related to conductivity, conductivity, semiconductivity or uh, insulation and uh, many other things. But uh, from the machine learning point of view, uh, you have, you need to predict this band gap energy. Uh, yeah, uh, so, and those crystals have uh, different sizes, a uh, different number of atoms. So you need to take that into account when you batch your solution, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the quality metric is not the trivial mean absolute error because mean absolute error won't tell us uh, how useful your prediction is. What 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 we really care about is how your like uh, the 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 mean point uh, the mean number of uh, points that lie within uh, epsilon threshold from the actual ground truth, which is in this case is uh, a density functional theories. Uh, it's not what uh, other people have suggested. It's like uh, the street Fourier transform. Uh, this is totally different thing. This is like a, just a, a, te a very uh, a technique that uh, calculate those energy uh, in a very computationally heavy way. Uh, and we are trying to approximate uh, or uh, build the surrogate model of this uh, DFT method using machine learning, where it's much faster and allow us to iterate uh, through the through the possible structures in much more efficient way. So uh, basically, the predicted energy minus uh, the absolute ground truth uh, DFT energy, and this is basically the uh, MIE loss, uh, but. Uh, 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 this difference needs to be smaller than this number 0.02. Uh, and if it's, uh, well, smaller then it's two and you basically need to count uh, the ones and the zeros and in the end you will end up with percentage of how many, uh, the percentage of your, uh, of the points lying, uh, lying within the uh, epsilon difference from the DFT. So this is the quality metric. And our baseline is basically based on magnet, which is uh, uh, if we, uh, which is basically a graph neural network uh, that uh, that uh, is uh, uh, treated for uh, molecules and crystals. Uh, and uh, why do we use the graph neural networks? Well, uh, mainly because of the uh, uh, of the well uh, right inductive bias. And uh, we can uh, embed into it uh, the right uh, invariance and equivalences because we know that a crystal is basically uh, it's it's a crystal no matter how how you rotate it. So you need to take into this 
uh, rotation. One form of uh, taking this uh, invariant rotation invariance in this case is by basically augmenting your data with different rotations, but uh, that's inefficient way. It won't yield the uh, optimal results. So like there is a uh, more um, mathematical ways to do this invariances, so you need to take this into account. And since this is uh, this is this supercell is basically the same and can be replicated infinitely along the axes, uh, so uh, we need to take into account something called periodic boundary conditions. So basically. Uh, the distance between this point, between this atom and this atom is not this trivial distance. The distance is actually very, very small. And, uh, the assumption that uh, this uh, is replicated infinitely on a periodic boundary condition, the distance is basically similar to the distance between this point and this point. So basically whatever on the boundaries will be reflected to this. So this periodic boundary condition need to be taken into account. Uh, and uh, graph neural networks allow us to formulate those requirements in a very nice and physically intuitive way. So uh, this is regarding like the the like the general overview of the baseline. Now uh, let's go to the data. So uh, how are you gonna actually like walk your way? Uh, around the baseline. So basically when you clone the GitHub, you'll get those two archives. So let's extract them. Uh, so go to the data, then we extract them. So uh, if you use uh, like Windows, you're probably gonna need to extract twice since you're gonna first of all unarchive the tar, then do the unzipping. But uh, if using uh, Linux, just use uh, add the Z argument to extract uh, uh, to do the unzipping at the same time. And we ended up with with this. So we will have structures on targets. Our targets is basically the ID of the crystal and its corresponding band gap energy, right? And for the structures, uh, we will have a PyMagin JSON file, which contain, uh, which contain all the crystal uh, uh information that is required so uh, if you go to PyMagin uh documentation uh, you can see how to load those J json files in, into uh, uh PyMagin object directly and uh, PyMagin will give you a lot of uh, uh helper methods to deal with such uh, objects uh so here like it, bunch of data uh, i don't think you will ever need to work with those json files directly you're going to use uh, deal with them through pymagin uh, interface uh, so you load them and you will get your object uh, right so uh, once you do this uh, then the baseline is maybe let me know all this uh, so the baseline uh, 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 yeah, so it, uh, as I said, relies on magnet, and uh, here's like a, a simple uh, baseline that uh, that is also the checkpoint here uh, that is trained to uh, achieve 0.63 uh, energy with a threshold. Uh, uh, okay, so once you train it, uh, you can uh, you can generate. Uh, well, we have a make file. Uh, here that allow you to train directly. So if you go make train, uh, you will it will start the training script. But uh, let's assume that you all be trained and uh, 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 we can generate uh, the submission file by just running make uh, run, which will uh, generate uh, that submission uh, for us. And this failed here for obvious uh, some reasons. Uh, but it doesn't matter. So you uh, this run, which will invoke this run script, which will uh, will uh, run generate submission Python file. Uh, these are like you may use them or you may rewrite them yourself, but like they are here and allow you to submit. So once you run this uh, script, you will have a submission file, uh, which is a CSV of um, your IDs and your predictions, uh, and uh, how to actually submit it to the Yandex contest. You just like, uh, 
go to the antics contest submissions then submit a solution on uh, the syntax phase so we pick the solution uh, what is it submission yeah yeah and you submit it uh, and uh, you will have your points here uh, and that's uh, well all you need to basically to to uh, all you need to in order to submit your first uh, attempt. Uh, so uh, now, uh, do you have any questions uh, regarding the baseline, the task itself, the data? Feel free to ask. So should we use magnet for our prediction or we can use another one? Uh, use whatever you want. Uh, this is just a baseline example. We are free to do whatever. Uh, what's the main difference between task A and B? So the difference between task A and B, task A is that you're gonna run and train uh, everything on your local machine, generate the CSV file and submit it to the IDA uh, and it will be graded uh, or ranked according to your submission but uh, in the end uh, like after the finish of the competition you will need to send us your actual uh, script and we will basically verify what uh, whatever you've done uh, but uh, the, the what i'm trying to say is that uh, it won't run on yandex contest uh, machines it will run on your machine so it, uh, it can be very computationally expensive uh, arbitrary uh, stacking of neural network whatever you want to do for track two it's need to be efficient and uh, this efficiency will be taken into account when uh, your solution is submitted uh, you will need to basically submit uh, not a csv file but uh, uh, like a zip file that contain uh, pretty much all the code that is required to run your solution into yandex cloud uh, where can I get login and password? Well, uh, ask the organizers. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about this. Uh, is it okay for code? Well, <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Is it possible to convert PyMagin structure into something, maybe something like NumPy? Well, yeah, of course, but PyMagin structure is not just an array. It's a, uh, it's basically imagined as a dictionary where you have a bunch of attributes on their values. Uh, the probably like uh, uh, if you were to deal with the only X, Y, Z location, then yeah, you can convert it to NumPy array. But it's not like a just homo homogeneous uh, uh, array of uh, types. Violent uh, again, this is not a Fourier transform. DFT is density functional theory. It has nothing to do with Fourier transform. Use a Fourier transform however you like. It's uh, just a method. Uh, can we use pre trained model other data sets for training? Well, uh, use, use them. Yeah, why not? But at uh, yeah, your own. <laughs> So, so I'll stop sharing uh, now. Uh, if, if you have any question, then please ask. Uh, so I see. Uh, do we have to submit only your modified baseline? No. If you have joined any competition. Uh, there is a baseline and uh, it's just like a guidance how to deal with the data how to submit and you build your own solution you could uh, solve the entire task without using the baseline the baseline is just an example of uh, a solution and the goal is to have a better solution than this uh, is the hackathon limited to python or we can invent solution of the other language well i uh, it's uh, uh, the language is relevant as long as your solution is uh, decent uh, then do solve it uh, however you like uh, or we can use 
from our eigen scientists. Uh, did magnet uh, get parametric structure as input into the baseline solution? Uh, yes, it, it deals with parametric structures. Uh, where can I find this and some of the attributes and the JSON? Uh, Biomagen documentation. There is, uh, like, if you go to part, okay, I'm not showing my screen. Uh, let me share it real quick. So, uh, Biomagen, I guess you see, yeah, I should be seeing my screen. Uh, so, this is Biomagen structure, which have a bunch of uh, attributes like center of mass, uh, uh, card coordinates, uh, card, uh, which represent the Cartesian coordinates, uh, ca Cartesian coordinate, charge, composition, distance matrices, bunch of uh, things that will be necessary uh, for you. Okay. Okay, so I guess. Well, okay, if you have uh, uh, no question, then have a good luck with the competition. Uh, thank you, Aziz. Uh... Yes, I think there are no more questions. If this is the case, then thank you all for attending the presentation. Thanks to all our speakers. And of course, to Yandex, to our platinum partner at Krita Bank and to Lambda Lab for preparing the task. Uh, have a good luck and we'll see you later.